Hello, this is Harriet Whitting again. This lecture is about measurement in physiotherapy clinical care. In order to illustrate the measurement in clinical care, we're going back to the case of Caitlin. Remember, she was a 39-year-old female with a 15-year history of back pain, slight radiation into her leg. She had an acute onset of back pain while moving house 15 years ago with lifting and bending. She then saw a physiotherapist who told her she had a displaced vertebra. She got NSAIDs, but has been having recurrent exacerbations since. The latest ex exacerbation was one month ago, and she now has constant nagging pain and rates her pain as a 6 out of 10. She has difficulty cleaning house, bending, lifting, and getting up from a chair. Her work is cleaning house twice a week. She finds her work increasingly difficult and is fearful her complaints will get worse. And she's being very careful with her back and she comes to you wanting to decrease her pain so she can function better. We talked about the ICF in another lecture and here's her health profile which we're trying to complete. With the impairments, activity limitations, participation restrictions, the environmental factors and the personal factors. We want to fill in all of these boxes to get a complete picture of what's going on with her. So to fill these boxes, we need to measure her impairments, which means doing an objective examination, including her range of motion, strength, endurance, do neurological testing, including sensory examination and reflexes. And you want to measure pain variables, such as pain intensity, pain duration, and interference of pain with physical activities. You, of course, also want to measure activity limitations, participation restrictions, which you can partially do by having people perform functional tests, which you can also give people questionnaires. Personal factors are best measured with questionnaires. So we've started to, to fill in the health profile and we now have filled in chronic low back pain. She has nagging back pain, slight little radiation into her leg. She has difficulty bending over, lifting, carrying, getting up and difficulty performing household tasks. You know in her environmental factors that she's getting NSAIDs from her a primary care physician and that a physical therapist told her she has displaced vertebra. So at this point, what do you want to measure? Think about which aspects of her would you like to measure and which tools would you use for that? So you need to consider which domain you want to measure. Do you want to measure function, personal factors, activities, external factors or participation? You look at measurement tools, you can broadly divide them into generic and disease specific tools. The generic tools have a broad application across different types of severity of diseases. So these are tools that you can give to people with all sorts of diagnoses and compare them to each other. So it enables comparisons of quality of life burden and treatment benefit across diseases. And a famous example, of course, is the SF36, the health rate to quality of life measurement. Disease specific measurements are specific to the disease you're trying to measure. So the back pain specific, shoulder specific, um, CPD specific, fibromyalgia specific, and on and on. They assess the special states and concerns of the diagnostic groups, and they're more sensitive for the detection and quantification of small changes that are important to clinicians or patients. And an example is the Quebec Low Back Pain Disability Scale, which is in the Dutch Guidelines for Low Back Pain. So you also want to think about what the purpose of your measurement is. Do you want to diagnose patients, get some sense of their prognostic factors, or do you want to evaluate your treatment? And different clinometric properties are important for different 
purposes. For diagnostic instruments, you want sensitivity and specificity, um, where sensitivity refers to the, the probability of a person with a condition of interest having a positive result, where specificity is the probability of a person without a condition of interest having a negative result, as in you want to be able to diagnose back pain when people have back pain, and you want to be able to say they don't have back pain when they don't have back pain. For evaluative purposes, you want to get some sense of the minimal detectable change. The minimal detectable change is defined as the minimal change that falls outside the measurement error in the score of a measurement used to measure a symptom or a condition. Minimally clinical important change is defined as the minimal change in the score that is meaningful for patients. So a minimal detectable change is a score outside measurement error and minimally important change is a change that is meaningful to patients where they feel they've actually improved. So you want to also think about what the purpose of your measurement is. Do you want to measure between practitioners or do you want to measure between practices and hospitals? If you want to measure between practices and hospitals, you may want to use generic instruments and between practitioners, that's probably also the better option. So there are a lot of decisions to make in choosing a measurement instrument. For people who do not know the COSMIN, please go find it on the internet. It describes, describes in detail the measurement properties of outcome measurement instruments. You can see the, the galaxy of uh, kinematic properties you need for your instruments where reliability and validity, of course, are the most important ones. And within reliability, there's internal consistency, how well the items hang together, the measurement error that you can measure, the minimal detectable change, and the reliability, which is the test-retest reliability. For validity, content validity is very important, as well as construct validity, and then there's criterion validity. Responsiveness is needed for evaluation of your treatment and interpretability is how easily can we interpret the scores that the measurement tools yield. Going back to the case, you want to measure pain intensity. You can use a vase with anchors of no pain and the worst pain imaginable and scoring from 0 to 100 or 0 to 10. A numerical rating skill is often found more easy to understand by patients, and that can be done on a scale from 0 to 10 or 0 to 100 as well. For kids slightly older than three years, you can use the Wong Baker Faces Scale, um, where when you have a 10, you don't necessarily need to cry because you have so much pain. Uh, and this scale is also understood by the elderly. Young kids are not able to understand numbers yet, so you need to find another way to measure their pain. For very young kids, there, is, there are uh, skills that observe children, babies, and, and toddlers, uh, as well as there are skills for people with dementia or people who aren't able to verbalize their pain, where you can use observation skills. You can classify pain by mechanisms. Is it nociceptive pain, inflammatory pain, neuropathic pain, or nociceptive pain? To diagnose neuropathic pain, you can use the DN4 questionnaire, which is a widely used questionnaire to determine if patients have neuropathic pain or the pain detect questionnaire. You can see here, you can fill in a body diagram. It also has a picture that describes the course of the pain, which makes it clearer whether people have neuropathic pain or not. This is part two 
with questions like burning sensation, uh, allodynia, light touching, painful is allodynia, sudden pain attack, shooting pain, uh, cold or heat, occasionally painful, that also is a sign of allodynia. Uh, sensation of numbness, impaired sensation, slight pressure, triggering pain, might be hyperesthesia or allodynia. Anyway, these are all questions that are that relate to neuropathic pain. You can also also use this clinical decision making tree for nosoplastic pain, where pain needs to be present for longer than three months. It needs to have a widespread distribution. Um, you need to rule out nociceptive and neuropathic pain. There needs to be hypersensitivity slash allodynia, um, and there needs to be at least one comorbidity in the sense of poor sleep, poor concentration, um, sensitivity to sound or temperature. And then you can say that the patient has a possible nosoplastic pain. So we've had intensity, pain location, uh, pain interference is important. Other factors to consider are age and cognition in getting pain. The pain defense and veteran pain rating scale is a scale that asks about interference in physical activities. This I'm not sure has been validated for non-vets yet, but I thought it's a nice skill to show you we get some sense of how much pain interferes with physical activities. Important for physios to consider these scales. Then of course you want to think about what the guidelines tell you. This is the Royal Dutch Physiotherapy Guideline on low back pain and lumbar sacroradicular syndrome. It was developed in 22 and it looks much at the prognostic factors that predict whether patients will or will not have persistent pain. So these prognostic factors related to persistent pain are previous episodes of low back pain, high limitation in activities, pain in the leg, and high pain intensity. In our case of Caitlin, we see that she had previous episodes of pain. She has quite high limitations in activities. She has no pain in the leg, but her pain intensity is quite high. So patient-related factors are poor health-related quality of life, and psychosocial factors include psychological and psychosocial stress, pain-related fear of movement, which we see in Caitlin, depressive feelings or complaints, past coping, and negative expectations of recovery or catastrophizing. In addition, there are work-related prognostic factors, which include high physical load during work, poor relations with colleagues, and unhappiness with work. The guideline then distinguishes three treatment profiles with low risk, medium risk, and high risk, depending on the number of risk factors that are present. So at this point, do you have any thoughts of what you would like to measure? Pain location is a good idea. A body diagram can tell you a lot where this body diagram indicates localized pain. This body diagram indicates perhaps more distress than pain location and a poor prognosis. When looking at stratified care, we try to establish the risk for poor outcome. And of course, for that, we have the start back screening tool, which includes questions of somatic, cognitive, emotional, and behavior. You could give Caitlin the start back tool to assess her risk and find that she probably scores higher on the, the subscore than you would initially think. Most guidelines recommend questionnaires 
to assess participation difficulties using the Quebec Back Pain Disability Scale in the Netherlands, but the Oslo Strainer Ronald Morris questionnaires are always also used a lot. For personal factors, you could use the Fear Avoidance Questionnaire, Pain Self-Efficacy and Catastrophizing, for instance. We have now done more work on her objective examination. We have filled in that her mechanism, pain mechanism is nauseplastic. Her pain rating intensity is 70. Um, her objective examination is mostly negative. Her Oswald Street score is 70. Her Roland Morris score is 15. And in the fear avoidance questionnaire, her physical activity is 23. And her work is 33 points out of 42. The pain catastrophizing skill shows an 8 on rumination, 7 on magnification, 20 on helplessness, and a pain self-efficacy skill is 19. So what do all these numbers mean? I yeah, listed them here. This is at the beginning of treatment. So the Quebec Back Pain Disability Scale asks uh, a number of activity impairments and on a scale from not difficult at all to unable to do. It has 20 items, the minimal score is 20 and the maximum score is 100. Higher scores correlate to greater disability. So the percentage of maximal disability is her score is 70 minus 20 is 50 divided by 80 is 62 and a half. So her times 100, so her percentage is 62 and a half, which is on the high side. The minimal detectable change is 15 points. So she scores quite a high impairment in participation. The Oslo Street Disability Index has 10 items in the original um, index pain intensity, personal care, lifting, walking, sitting, standing, sleeping, sex life, social life, and travel. And these are the kinds of questions that you get. Walking, pain does not prevent me from walking any distance. Pain prevents me from walking more than a mile. Pain prevents me from walking more than half a mile. Pain prevents me from walking more than a quarter mile. I can only walk with crutches or a cane. I am in bed most of the time and have to crawl to the toilet. So there's increasing severity in each question. Caitlin has scored 70 on the Oslo Street. The, sc the item scoring is 0 to 5, with the most severe impairment being 5. Uh, the total score is the sum of the 10 items times 2. And the total score is five times the number of the answered items times 100, which ends you up with a 0 to 100 percent disability score. She scored 70, which means that she's basically crippled on this scale. And when you compare her to the literature, we know that the mean score for low back pain patients is 27 and 43.3 for patients with uh, chronic back pain. So she scores way beyond that. We know the scale is reliable, has an internal consistency that's good enough, is valid, and the responsiveness is 10 points for a minimally important change. Meaning this patient has to decrease 10 points or more to have an important clinical change in her therapy outcomes. The Ronald Morris questionnaire has 24 items and 8 domains, and you score yes or no. The range is from 0 to 24, with 0 being no disability and 24 being severe disability. It's an easy questionnaire to, to answer, and it asks about physical activities it says it stays at home. I stay at home most of the time because of my back. I change position frequently to try and get my back comfortable. 
I walk more slowly than usual because of my back. Because of my back, I'm not doing any of the jobs that I usually do outside the house, etc. So Caitlin's course 15 on the Roland Morris questionnaire. We know the range is from 0 to 24, with 0 being no disability and 24 being maximum disability. So 15 is kind of slightly beyond the average. Reliability is quite good with an ICC of 0.75 and the internal reliability with Cronbach's Alpha is excellent. The instrument is valid and responsiveness is five points for the minimally important change. Extraordinary. We all know that the, uh, the fear avoidance model, I hope, where injury can lead to a pain experience, and if it goes the way of pain catastrophizing, it can lead to pain-related fear, avoidance, and disuse, or it can lead to pain experience, can lead to no fear, confrontation, and recovery. And so fear avoidance is an important item to measure, and the patient scores 23 on physical activity and 33 at work. There are 16 items in the fear avoidance beliefs questionnaire with a seven point Laika scale with item responses ranging from zero strongly disagree to six strongly agree. It has two subscales with seven items on the relationship between low back pain and work and four items on physical activity. The total score of the work scale is zero to 42 and the total score of the physical activity scales is 0 to 24. We see that physical activity is 23, so that's almost at the end of the scale, and for work it's 33, which is also quite high. This is what the questionnaire looks like. The physical activity questions are about my pain was caused by physical activity, physical activity makes my pain worse, physical activity may harm my back, I should not do physical activities, which make, might make my pain worse, and on. So the mean fear avoidance physical activity score was 14 at baseline and retest. And the work score was 14 and 14 on average in large sample of patients. Reliability is good and the alpha is moderate. We know that predictive ability is that the work skill score higher than 34 means that people are not likely to return to work. And Caitlin's score is just underneath that. So we need to consider her return to work. But both these scores shows that she has high fear avoidance of both physical activity and work, and that may be an entry into her treatment. This is the, the catastrophizing skill. I worry about all the time whether it will end. I feel I can't go on. It's terrible and I think I'm, it's never going to get better. It's awful and it feels it overwhelms me, etc. So this is the questionnaire, this is the fit pain self-efficacy questionnaire that says I can enjoy things despite the pain, I can do most of the household chores despite pain, I can socialize with my friends, etc. So here from this questionnaire you can see that the higher you score, the higher your pain self-efficacy, meaning that you can deal with your pain on your own. So higher scores are we are now looking at the outcomes of Caitlin's treatment. We see that her NRS pain has decreased from 6 to 4.5. The Ronald Morris has decreased from 15 to 10. The Oswald Street and the Quebec have both decreased. And the Oswald Street has decreased from 70 to 40 and the Quebec from 70 to 50. Her pain self-efficacy questionnaire, we measured at the baseline um, and not at the follow-up. We can see that we've achieved minimally important change in both the Roland Morris, the Austria, 
and the Quebec, but we haven't achieved clinically important change in pain. Her pain self-efficacy questionnaire is more a diagnostic tool than a uh, evaluative tool, so we don't know if our pain self-efficacy has changed. Overall, I think we've done well. Thank you. Thank you for your time, and good luck with choosing your measurement instruments. Addressing her fear avoidance and addressing Spain, her self-efficacy may help her in regain some control over her back pain in her life. I hope this has helped you in thinking about how you decide which measure to use, and I thank you for your attention.